and bring the message. I appreciate all that good singing this morning. A lot of times people say, well, I don't want to sing in the choir because I can't sing. You know, you get up here and you're liable to the Lord, liable to give you all kinds of talents you didn't know you had. Like that one preacher told him, said, told this man, he said, you've got to get out of that choir. He said, why? He said, five or six people told me you couldn't sing a lick. And he said, well, that ain't nothing. Fifty people told me you couldn't preach. So, there ain't none of us professionals this morning. <laughs> All right, Luke chapter number 12. Luke chapter number 12. Now, I want you to listen real careful this morning as we read this story. Very familiar to some of you. Probably the first time others have heard it, and that's who the message is for. So, if, you, if you're real familiar with the Scripture and you're ready to meet God and you're all prayed up and everything, please pray during the message this morning. For those that are here that are unprepared to meet God. That's who the message is for. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In this story we find this. A man that was one heartbeat from hell and didn't know it. A man who was one heartbeat away from hell and didn't know it. One of the most shocking, horrible, sobering, scary, soul-shattering truths and thoughts in all the world is, to me it is, is that a man could be laughing and talking and enjoying life and prospering one minute and the next minute look up and look around him and see nothing but fire in a place that he would be in forever and never be able to get out. I can't think of anything more shocking and horrible than that. Yet that's what this story is about this morning. The Bible is truth. The Bible tells it like it is. The Bible don't hold back no punches. The Bible tells us today that a man can be prosperous and healthy and happy and have everything he can want to put his hands on one minute, minute be lowered to a slave in hell fire where he'll never get a drop of water on his tongue or will ever have anybody to come and rescue him or give him any help at all. That's the picture that the Bible presents of a man. You can be in this world laughing one minute, in the next world screaming the next minute. It illustrates the old truth that the country preachers used to use, quote, going to hell with your shoes on. I want you to notice a few things about this man this morning. And the first thing I want you to notice is that he was rich. He had a lot of things. I don't know if he inherited it. I don't know if he... I'm sure he surely didn't work... You know, it's hard to work honest and get rich. He either probably was a crook or inherited it once. And he might have got it honestly, but I doubt it. But anyway, he had a lot of money. And he made it through businesses and he had uh, business transactions going and he had a lot of money. Now there's nothing wrong with having a lot of money except that it can be a curse if it's not handled properly. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 11.4 
that riches profit not in the day of wrath. That means there will come a day when no matter how much money a man has, it will not do him any good whatsoever. There's a lot of movie stars find that out from day to day. You hear about them so-and-so dying at 60, so-and-so dying at 73, so-and-so dying at a heart, of a heart attack at 55, and they realize that no matter how much money they have in the bank, it will not profit them when the day comes for them to die. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs chapter 11 that he that trusteth in his riches shall fall. Now, Jesus made an amazing statement in the Gospels about rich people, and it's had people bumfuzzle down through the ages. He said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, for all these years, people have said, Good night, why did the Lord say that? It's easier to put a camel through the eye of a needle. And they've tried to explain it away every way in the world. I've even heard preachers try to make up some flimsy little excuse like some gate over in Jerusalem called a needle's eye and the camel had to get down on his knees to go through. That ain't what the Bible said. And you know why we know that ain't what the Bible means? It's because two verses below it, the Lord said it was impossible. Amen? It wasn't impossible for them camels to go through that gate. He was talking about a real needle with a real hole in it and a real camel. He said it's impossible with man, but what's impossible with man is not impossible with God. That means a rich man can be saved, but it's mighty, mighty hard. It takes a miracle of God. Do you know why that is? Do you know why it's so hard for a rich person to trust God? Because money goes to a person's head. And and when a person gets a lot of money, they get to trust in it. It's almost impossible not to trust in it if you've got a lot of money. So you ought to pray for all the poor rich people. They're pitiful. They really are. You're sitting there thinking them lucky dogs. I'd like to have it for a while. But really, when you get to thinking about it, uh, people who have a lot of money are in bad shape when it comes to spiritual things unless God has worked a miracle to them. But anyway, he had a lot of money. I don't know where they kept it back in them days. Maybe in, in, in safes. Maybe in trunks locked up in some quarters in the house that people were guarding. I don't know. Probably didn't have, have it in uh, no whole lot of banks. They probably had some. But anyway, he had a lot of money. But it didn't do him any good on the day that he died. Then secondly, he prospered. Notice his ground brought forth plentifully. Here was a man that did not love God, did not know God, did not care about God, did not care about anything of the church. Yet when he planted his gardens... God in heaven looked down and let it rain on his garden and his fruit come up and he just had beautiful tomatoes and and, and green beans and, and corn out of that garden. Now that illustrates how good God really is. You know who makes gardens grow? It's God. Do you know who lets food come out of the ground that you and I can set it on our table and feed our kids? It's God. It's the goodness of God that lets all these things happen. You know, it's talking about tomatoes being so high right now. And the, they, the Lord let that freeze come last fall and kill them tomato plants. And now tomatoes are as high as steak. I guess you saw in the steakhouse they don't even have tomatoes on the salad bar right now in a lot of places because there just ain't many of them. You might have saw that, uh, I guess it was a joke, but they had this restaurant on the news and on the outside of the sign it said... Special today, tomato sandwich, nine ninety five. I think they was joking about that, but what they were saying was they're scarce, they're hard to get a hold of. And I thought about that. I said it's God Almighty that lets them things grow to begin with. It's amazing. It's a wonder God don't let us all starve to death, as wicked as this world is. You know it. But that's the goodness of God letting them fruits grow. And God looked down to that old boy. He said that that old boy don't love me, and he don't never go to church or nothing. But I'm going bless Him and let His gardens grow. That's the way some of us are. We don't never give God a second thought sometimes and yet 
that God lets water fall out of the sky and God lets water run out of the mountains and fill our wells and God lets our crops grow and God lets fruit grow on our apple trees and pear trees. He prospered this man. He made more money. He had it made. He stored up his crops and grain. He could have given it to the poor and never missed it, but he didn't. You know what he done? He said, man, I've got so much stuff that I don't know what to do with. And boy, he had, he said, I'm going to tear down my barns. And he hired this group of construction workers to come in, take a big old steel ball or something, bam, knock his barns down, bring in lumber from 84, lumber or patty, lumber company or somewhere. And boy, they started a building it there, building great big barns. And he said, I'm going to sit back. I'm going to put my, my easy chair and I'm going to rock and look over my plantation and buddy I am going to have it made he got famous he got well known that's what a celebrity is by the way a celebrity is somebody who works all their life to become famous and then wears dark glasses to keep from being recognized that's what he did he he, he said I want to get rich I want to have a lot so he prospered but notice thirdly he was industrious there's one thing you got to say for that fella even though he was wicked he wasn't lazy amen I mean he worked he tore his barns tore down he built and sold and worked and, and built bigger barns and had men cruising and, uh, and stuff like that they had building projects going on all the time do you know where he made his mistake all he cared about was this life all he cared about was that bank account all he cared about folks you know as well as I know that the main mistake people in McDowell County are making this morning is that all they can think about is another day another dollar bills paid college for the kids house to pay for cars to pay for and forget God leave God out of their life that's a terrible mistake for you to make and you go to them and talk to them to ask them to come to church and you know what they say I don't have time Preacher, I work six days a week. I work seven days a week. Sunday's my only day to rest. I don't have time to God for God. But I'll tell you what you'll do. You'll have time to die one of these days. And after you die, you'll have plenty of time to think about the mistake you've made by leaving God Almighty out of your life. You know what? I'm so thankful this morning that I got saved when I did. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. I'm glad I got saved when I did. I was 18 years old when I got saved. I didn't own a house. I didn't own any property. Thank God that I didn't. You know something? There's something about as you get older, you get in your 20s and you're raising children, you get in your 30s, and you're put, trying to put them through school. You get in your 40s. Yeah, there's something about the longer you wait to get saved, the harder it seems to be able to trust God. You just get self-satisfied. This man, I don't know how old he was. He was probably in midlife. And buddy, he did not have time for God. But don't you to notice number four this morning, even though he was rich, even though he prospered, even though he was industrious and had a lot of things that did not stop God more one day from requiring his soul. And the Bible said God required that man's soul. One day God rang his bell. His number came up. It was his turn. No matter how rich a person is or how poor or how much they own, when God Almighty rings your bell and pulls up your number, you're going then naked. You came into this world naked. You're going to leave. You know how you're going to face God in your birthday. Hey, suit, brother, just like you got here into this world, and you will not be able to have one word of resistance against facing God. One night God required his soul. He didn't realize that Hebrews would say it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this to judgment. God said, It's your turn! Ready or not? Let's go! God already had a date set for him. By the way, God's got a date set for you and me too. Now let me see if you can get this through our heads this morning. Y'all help me now. We need it real quiet. Everybody listen. If the Lord don't come and rapture us out of here, every single one of us has got a date that we're going to die. I mean, I know you can sit there and say, yeah, that's right. But think about it. It's your turn coming up one day. It's my turn. I tell you what I could probably do. I'm not going to do this, but I could probably be safe to say 
that somebody in this room will not be living by Christmas of this year. Probably. The odds are that they're, they're going out like flies. About three, two people every second die somewhere in this world. It doesn't matter how young you are, healthy you are. Age has absolutely nothing to do with it. When God said, your time's coming, you're going. And I'll tell you something else. I don't care how much money you've got. You can have every doctor in the world working on you. When God pulls your number, you're checking out of here. You're going. You are going, friend. You're going. If that would ever dawn on us that we're going to die, that we've got a date with death, that we've got a date, as one preacher said at the Bible conference, with the dust one day. We're going down. We wouldn't be so concerned about our popularity and who we are in this world and making a name for ourselves if we would realize that one day life's going to go out of this body. They're going to fix up our body up here at one of these funeral homes. They're going to roll us down here in front of this building. People are going to look at our face for the last time. And brother, when that day comes, only what we've done for the Lord Jesus Christ will mean anything. God required the man's soul. You hear me this morning? This may be the first time you've ever laid eyes on me in your life. You may have never been to this church. I'm sure there's people like that here. And I, I don't want to make any enemies. I've got enough. Lord knows already. But I want to stand boldly and tell you this morning that you are going to die. That God's going to call your name. And this may be your last day on earth. Just like it was that man's. You never know. The clock of life is wound but once. And no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop. Help me now. Listen carefully. At late or early hour. To lose one's health is sad indeed. To lose one's wealth is more. To lose one's soul is such a loss. No man can restore. Notice the next thing about this man. He was not prepared to die. His heart had been beating ever since he was a little baby. He had taken it for granted. Your heart beats average of 75 times a minute. It can beat even when other nerves are cut. Your heart beats 40 million times a year. If you live to be 70 years old, your heart will beat two and a half billion times. Y'all help me now. We need it quiet in here. Please help me. It's absolutely important that everybody be able to hear. Your heart does enough work in one hour to lift a 150 pound man to the top of a three story building. And nobody knows what makes your heart beat that don't believe in God. Anybody who says there's no God can't, can't explain why that heart keeps doing that. What makes it do that? You say, well, you're alive. What's life? Does life make your heart beat or does your heart beat make you have life? And that thing just going. You say, boy, i got to keep myself in shape and keep my heart beating. Who keeps it beating while you're asleep at night? Who keeps it a beating when you're in the emergency room and they got kids running in your body and you don't even know you're in the wall? Who makes your heart keep beating? God does, friend. Your heart's in His hands this morning. Boom. 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 Just like that. And did you know this morning that one day God will look down and He'll say, Alright, three. Two, one, stop! And when that heart stops by the order of God, then ain't nobody in the world can make it beat again. God controls your heartbeat! That old boy got up that morning. He did not know. When he got up that he was eating his last breakfast. He did not know that would be his last meal. The last time he talked with his wife. The last meeting the men downtown at the gates. The last walk around the farm. The last time you'd ever see the sunrise. He didn't know. That was his last day on earth. He didn't know it. So I was studying last night and praying. Listen carefully. 
God began to deal with my heart. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? And I had some other thoughts I wanted to preach on. And the Lord just kept burning this Scripture in my heart. Burning this Scripture in my heart. And I said, God, you reckon maybe somebody might be there and that will be their last day? And I don't know. That's in God's hands. He holds the future. He knows what's coming. I don't. But I'm telling you one thing. It's a dangerous chance that you're taking to walk out these doors unprepared to meet God. It's a terrible, terrible chance. He was not ready to die. Ponce de Leon came down there to Florida in 1569 and he was going to discover the fountain of youth. And all down through the ages of time, people have been trying to discover something to keep them from dying. Did you know what science has done to lower the death rate in 6,000 years of studying in laboratories? Nothing. You say, well, they've heard somebody and they saved their life. Yeah, but they finally died, didn't they? You know how many people is alive today that was born in the 1700s? None. We're going, buddy. We're going. They're not going to invent something in the next year or two to keep you alive forever. Don't count on it, friend. Don't count on it. God Almighty already said in the book, it's upon it when a man wants to die. After this, the judgment. You'll face God. You've heard me tell it, maybe. But I think about this about every time I start preaching like this. I have preached for a few years before it really dawned on me that I'm going to die. And we had a funeral up there in the old building of a girl, wasn't but 19, she got killed. And I preached the funeral. We drove around downtown, went down the bottom, around Main Street down there, and up in the the cemetery over there. And we were driving up in there that day, and you know, the police cars first, then the preacher, and then the hearse. So I was driving up through there, and the police stopped there, you know, and I was driving up through there first, and I noticed that grave there and that great big pile of red dirt. And for the first time, really hard, that thing hit me like a bowl of lightning. And boy, it's just like a Holy Ghost said, Hey boy, one of these days they're going to be putting you in one of them holes. And your body's going to be in there. And you're going to be laying back there. And they're going to cover you up with that dirt. And just a scare and a fear come over me. And I said, that's right, Lord. I'm not always going to be here. They're going to put me under. Let me ask you something. Are you living a life that's pleasing to God so that if you know you had to die today, you could face it? Now, come on now. Be honest about it. If you knew you had to face God today, you say, oh Lord, preacher, if I don't talk like that, if I knew I was going to die today, I'd have to make all kinds of changes. You better get with it, friend. Because that man didn't know it was his last day, neither. He didn't know. They said the leader of India many, many years ago, on his last day, had all his riches brought in before him. And he brought chest in with his money and his riches and jewels and diamonds, and he'd reach over and touch them and cry. And say, I went, I sacrificed and I worked hard, but now I must die and leave them all. You've heard me tell a story, and I won't, I won't tell this in detail because we're too close to home this morning. I'll tell it off when I'm in other states. There's a young man right here in this town who I met, I used to, uh, was playing basketball with some boys and just a, a time or two, and I met him years ago. And I began to talk to him one day and I said, called his name and I said, you a Christian? He said, no. I said, you go to church anywhere? He said, I was raised a Catholic. I said, but if you died, would you be ready to meet the Lord? He said, no. And I said, won't you come up to church? And he knew, you know, he heard about the church and all. And one day, it snowed. I believe it was on a Wednesday evening. 
And it snowed all that day. And as you know, we always have service when it snows. And it snowed. We was metting up around the old building on the hill. And it was so bad, cars couldn't even hardly get up the hill out there. And I met some of you were there that night. We didn't have a piano player. Very few people could get out, just a little handful. It was so bad, it snowed all day long. And that night, we put the little thing like this and took it down on this side of the church and just didn't preach from the pulpit because we just had a, a little handful of people. And I looked up that night and the back doors opened to the church and in that boy walked. And boy, when I saw him, my heart said, Hallelujah. He's here. And God's going to save him tonight. And I went back there and I shook his hand. I said, Man, it sure is good to see you here. His eyes was kind of bloodshot and I could smell liquor on his breath. He wasn't drunk, but he'd been drinking. And I said, It sure is good to see you. And he said, Thank you. And I said, Come on in and sit down. One of the men went back and sat down beside him, tried to make him feel welcome. That boy, just in his early 20s, I think, had a wife and a little boy. That morning, or that night, I sat there, and I believe it was Brother Mike McDaniels brought the message, and we just played some guitars and sung. We dismissed the service that night, and I just knew he was going to get saved. I just knew he was. And I went back and talked to him, and he said, No, I'm not ready. I shook his hand. I said, Man, why don't you come to Alder and get saved? And he looked at me like this and shook his head and said, I've got a lot of problems, Danny. I said, But listen, the Lord, He's the answer to your problems. That's what you need to come to God for. The Lord can straighten those things out. He'd say, No. Maybe some other time. He walked out the door. Did you know it wasn't but just a few weeks later? I came up here one morning. I was across the street over at the store, and somebody said, Did you hear about so and so? And I said, Huh, what happened? He, his wife, little boy, wrecked. Had a terrible car accident the night before. Tractor and trailer fell on the car. Man and his wife was killed instantly. He had bucket seats and his seat was pushed back like that. And the only thing that saved the little boy, he was in that little hole behind the front seat and the back seat with his daddy's blood dripping down his face. They said when the ambulance workers got there, they began to cut and try to get him out of the... That little boy screamed, My daddy's dead! My daddy's dead! They said, Now son, don't cry and don't scream. Your daddy might not... He said, Yeah, my daddy's dead. I talked to him and he couldn't talk. And sure enough, his daddy was dead. And you know what I thought? I thought when I went in there... Or that morning, how was that? Just a few nights before, he'd stood up there and told me and shook his head and said, Danny, I got a lot of problems. He's gone now. It's too late. It's too late to come to the altar. I'll tell you one thing if he is here this morning, you'd find him down here too. And he said, Oh God! Oh God! Oh God! He wouldn't care who looked at him, who liked it, who didn't, who talked about it. Brother, there's a lot more important things in this world than your reputation and what you own and who you are and who people think you are. He's coming back in revival one night. Me and Dan sitting over there. We seen a big wreck right down the road here. Car turned over off down there in the field. It was real late and they was just getting it out. And I said, man, that's a bad wreck. It looked like somebody got hurt awful bad. Next day I found out. It was a young man here in Marion. I'm, I'm not trying to bring out any open wounds for anybody. I realize this may be somebody that was close to you. And Lord knows that's not my intention. I'm trying to illustrate a point. Please, please forgive me if you feel, feel that way about it. And somebody said, did you know that boy? And I said, no, I didn't know him. Who was he? And they said, he's in the auto parts store yesterday. And they said, that boy walked in there and I hollered at him. And they said, you know how men will say, where are you headed? Looked at him and said, where are you heading? So and so and called his name. And he got him some parts to work on that car that he wrecked. And as he walked out of the auto parts store right up the street here, he turned around and said, hell if I don't change my ways. And locked out the door. And in less than 12 hours, he was there. See, you never know! You don't know! 
know when you'll draw your last breath. You don't know when God will say, it's over for that man or that woman. You say, oh, I don't believe in all this old scary preaching. Yeah, you can, you can give any excuse you want to, but you'll remember me warning you one day that you're going to die and face God. I know it's not popular preaching. And I'm not winning a run a popularity contest. I'm trying to preach what God gave me to preach to you this morning. And the Lord said, tell them you can be one heartbeat from hell and never know. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who likes me in this town and who don't. It doesn't matter who's the most popular preacher in town. Who cares, brother? Just prepare to meet God. That's all that's going to matter one of these days. Run to Jesus while you still got breath. This man woke up, put on his shoes and socks. But you learned, you've heard the old saying, You may tie your shoes this morning, the undertaker may untie them before tonight. Let's stand by our head. Now I know tonight, this morning, that God spoke to some people's hearts. And I'd like complete silence, every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm scared to die. The way I'm a living preacher, I couldn't face God and feel good about it. You may be here this morning and say, Brother Danny, I've never been saved. I don't know what it means to lay down on my pillow at night. And know my sins are forgiven. I don't know what it's like to be able to sing and shout like those people up in the choir a few minutes ago and know my sins are gone. Maybe you're a teenager here. Maybe you're just a child. Maybe you're just 9 years old, 10 years old, 12, 13. If God has spoke to your heart, hey, you're not too young to die, friend. And we're going to give an invitation. We're going to pray. And if you need to do business with God this morning, we've already got some coming to altar. If God Almighty has spoken to your heart, why don't you come? Why don't you come this morning and settle it? It's never going to get no easier than it is today. I'll tell you something. Every time your heart beats, that's the mercy of God. That's the mercy of God. Don't turn him down, friend. Tomorrow may be too late. Dear God in heaven, I pray that Thou would speak to people's hearts this morning. Bring conviction. Conviction, Holy Ghost conviction upon the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls. Lord, shake us, shake us this morning. Hang them out as it were over hell. Let them realize it's nothing to joke about. Oh, God, let them see the reality of death, judgment, the lake of fire. Lord, help that one that's been running from you a long time to make their way down these aisles, down to this altar, to settle the thing between them and you once and for all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you commit that sin again, you start going. That's a blessing. He's doing us a favor. He's doing us a favor by beating the daylights out of us. And then use the word. Use the word. Any anybody in here that knows the Bible knows how Jesus Christ overcome temptation. It is written. It is written. It is written. Now, whatever your sin is, say your sin's a lust for money. All right. You get those scriptures. They that will be rich fall into many hurtful and foolish lusts with drowned men in perdition. That's on First Timothy or somewhere. Get you one of them. The love of money is the root of all evil. Love those verses. And when the temptation comes, quote to yourself. Preach yourself a sermon. Quote those verses. So I got a problem with alcohol, preacher. Learn Proverbs where it said, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever deceived thy by is not wise. Woe to him that puts a bottle to his neighbor's lips. You know, quote those scriptures to you. Use the Word of God. That's your sword. And then, resist. The Bible said, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And then, pray. 
I told somebody a bunch of times, they said, I'm having trouble with the temptation. What can I do about it? And I can tell you, and I'm, I'm, I, you know, my flesh is sorry as yours is. Now, I've got to practice what I preach, but I'll tell you how you can get the victory over any temptation that's getting you. Pray about it 30 minutes a day, and you'll quit. You'll get the victory over it. I promise you, you'll get the victory over it. I don't care what it is. How many of you say, well, Brother Danny, I've had this temptation, this bother me. Yeah, I bet you ain't prayed about it 30 minutes a day. You say, well, I got in there and I prayed all day and fasted. That's one day, that's good. What about every day? Well, I can't pray 30 minutes about one thing, I ain't got time. Well, if one thing is about ready to destroy your whole life, it'd be wise to devote 30 minutes to it until you get it whooped. Amen? Does that make sense? That's practical preaching of what I'm giving you this morning that will help you in your daily Christian life. And then the last thing I want to say is by accepting God's way of escape, you be determined to do your part. What it really boils down to a lot of times is we kind of enjoy the temptation and really don't want deliverance. And when you get like that, you pray until you say, God, you know how sorry I am. You know I even enjoy the sin. You know, God, that I don't even want to be delivered. And I'm a low-down dog. But help me to want what's right. Forgive me of my sins. And I'm going to do what the Bible says regardless of what I want. Let's all stand. With every head bowed and every eye closed... I'm going to pray this morning. We're going to sing a song. Maybe there's somebody here to say, Brother Danny, I can't go to the altar after you preached on that. People think I've been doing all kinds of bad things. Uh, anybody that thinks that's not the kind of person they should be. Anybody who's honest knows every one of us could be on this altar this morning. Temptation is real powerful if God's been dealing with you about something maybe there's something been almost to the point of destroying and wrecking your Christian life and you need to settle it today you ought to just come on to the altar and settle it amen thank God a lot of folks are already coming what is it God's dealing with you about today what is it dear Lord help us this morning give us what we need God we're weak we're nothing but flesh God, all we are is weak in the flesh. And we pray that you'd forgive us, wash us in the blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Help that one that's struggling right now. Lord, there's somebody here, they don't even think they can live a Christian life anymore because the devil and temptation has victory over them. Help them to, help them to get the victory over him. And we'll praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing this morning. A lot of folks are already coming praying. Doing business with God. Settling.